welcome everybody here in the house and also in the Zoom room. I'm very, very happy that our current NEH fellow, Professor Louise Hitchcock, is um, giving her lecture today here at the Albright. Before she um, starts her lecture, I'm happy to say a few words about her. It's really incredible um, always to um, prepare these little introductions because you learn so much about the researcher, but also about the character. Um, so Louise received her BA in political science and philosophy and her MA then in ancient history at the University of Southern California. And during her studies, the undergrad studies, she was heavily um, politically involved in the US Liber Liber Libertarian Party. And she was also working for presidential campaigns. In 1998, she received then her PhD in art history, also from UCLA, on um, a topic or the topic title was Fabricating Signification and Analysis of the Spatial Relationships Between Room Types in Minoan Monumental Architecture. And that thesis was then published in the year 2000 under the title Minoan Architecture, a Contextual Analysis, in which she not only um, looks at the function of monumental buildings, but also um, talks about the social meaning. Um, she taught for many years at UCLA and then joined Melbourne University in 2004. And she is there currently a professor in Aegean Bronze Age archeology span um, in the department of classics. Louise excavated in many countries in the US and California. She was working in Syria, um, in Greece, Egypt, and also in Israel. And in fact, um, her one of her former stays here as an Albright Fellow um, made the introduction to Erin Meir and on a field trip to um, Safi. And out of that meeting and the cooperation project from Bailan University, Melbourne University, um, started the excavations in Tel El Safi from 2007 to 17, also partly funded by the um, Australian Research Council. And um, you see the friendship between Louise and Erin also in the co-edited festschrift um, for Erin Meir, um, Louise co-edited in 2018. Um, and it's of course available in our wonderful library. Um, Louise, extensive teaching and publishing covers really um, a broad variety of topics such as Aegean, Cypriot, but also Philistine, archaeology and architecture, art history, of course, but she also focuses on theory, gender, space, um, identities, racism and orientalism as topics. And this is reflected in her major monographs um, that are very decisive in the field. So I mentioned only um, two of them in 1999, she co-edited the monograph Aegean Art and Architecture with Donald Preziosi, which is a um, comprehensive introduction to the field. Um, and in 2008, she published um, the book Theory in Classics, a student's guide, um, where she investigates key connections between classical study and critical theory. So um, her teaching practice, as well as her interest in Political science and also theory is really um, well seen here in that publication. Last but not least, she has this monumental project at the moment. She's working on the um, companion to Aegean art and architecture, this very famous um, Blackwell um, series together with um, B.A. Davis. And um, we're looking forward to seeing that um, volume out at some point. Louise, thank you for... Um, taking us um, into your research. The floor is yours. Thank you, Katerina, for that very generous introduction. I'm not sure if I recognize who that person was that you were <laughs> describing. Um, I think what ties my disparate research to areas together is an interest in space and identity, and that can be found throughout everything I do. Um, the topic of my uh, research project here, I actually finished when I was here in July, and it's going to be published any day now. And so Katharina twisted my arm and asked me to present something else. Um, and so I'm going to be talking about some also some recent research 
that goes back into my past, but also um, I've sort of re-excavated it and looked at it afresh is the topic of kingship in Minoan Crete. And because I have extra time here, um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the Minoans to give you an overview for 20 minutes. I'm also be, I'll also be talking about the Sumerians and Sumer in Lower Mesopotamia. I'm going to assume that most of you know where Sumer is. Um, and I'm going to also briefly mention Hachisos in Anatolia. But I'm, I'm assuming you know where Sumer is, but maybe I can tell you a little bit more about the Minoans. And um, the heyday of the Minoan civilization is from about 1900 to 1450 BCE. And um, the main uh, civilization was situated on the island of Crete, although the Minoans had colonies in uh, ancient Milita, ancient Milawanda, which is classical Miletus, and on the island of Kithra near Laconia. But Crete is their homeland. Um, it was settled, permanently settled in about 7,000 BC in the region of Knossos. Um, the island is one of the three or four largest islands in the Mediterranean, depending on how far you look westward for the Mediterranean. It's a bit smaller than um, Cyprus, Corfu, and Sicily, although it looks quite big. Whoops. And it's about 350 miles wide, um, 60 miles, I mean, long, uh, 60 miles wide at its widest point, which has, is characterized by the side of Knossos in the north and Festos in the south. The narrowest point is about six miles or 10 kilometers at the isthmus of Arapatra, where we have the site of Gornia in the north and Myrtos Pyrgos in the south. Um, and it was crossed by this mountainous backbone that includes the Lusiti Mountains, the Amalas Mountains in the west, um, and you have uh, rain-fed agriculture in the Mesera Plateau um, in the center, the Amalas Plateau in the west, and the Lusiti Plateau uh, towards the east. And there are a great many sites, um, and what you have is an increase and an explosion in sort of very wealthy sites in about um, 1700. But the ones I'm mainly going to be talking about today are circled here on the plan, Festos in the south, Tilosos, Knossos, and Malia in north central Crete, Gornia on the Bay of Mirabello in east Crete, Pyrgos Myrtos to the south of that, um, the Minoan palace at Katazakro in the far east of Crete, and the town of Pele Castro just north of it. Um, to give you a background, um, things tend to happen in Crete about a thousand years later than they do in Egypt and the Near East. And what you find in early Bronze Age Crete is fairly modest. Um, the main mo monumental architecture we get in this era are in the form of communal tombs. And these are somewhat monumental. And you get round ones in south central Crete, such as here at Camillari in the Mesera Plain. And then in eastern Crete, in the region of Maklos and Gornia, you get rectangular house-shaped tombs. And again, these were communal, the body of the person would be placed in the front. Then after it decayed, the bones would be swept to the back and the heads would be, the skulls would be um, piled up separately. And what happens in the early Bronze Age is you start to get exotic imports coming from the east. Um, various items, uh, various types of imported beads, such as amethyst and carnelian, um, gold objects, and ivory objects. And these are discussed in a 2008 um, AJ article by Cynthia Colburn, who was actually one of my classmates at UCLA. And she also talks about how within these exotic offerings that you get in tombs, you get certain other items that set the occupants or the owners of these items apart as special, such as diadems, such as this gold diadem you see here, and things like mace heads. So you have the sort of beginnings of social authority and ivory seals. And of course, ivory and gold were both imports. Uh, but again, the imports are not on the scale that you start to get in the period of the Minoan palaces. 
You also start, you also have decorated pottery in this era used for uh, drinking and pouring ceremonies. And the styles, the distinction in different pottery styles indicates a lack of social cohesion. And this, you can see this with the Vasiliki ware named for the Eastern Crete site of Vasiliki. On the left, where you have this modeled appearance, which is created by placing burning ender, embers against the pot, um, light on dark ware, and red on buff Ios Anufrius ware. So you have a lack of social cohesion. And this is also further indicated by the fact that you get round tombs in the south and rectangular tombs, house tombs in the east. Um, now, in 1900, something special happens. The Minoans inquire, acquire a new ship technology, that is the deep hulled ship with mast, which helps them to shrink maritime space and come more within the Near Eastern sphere of influence. And we know that they're traveling around the Near East. We have Minoan style frescoes um, in Egypt at Avaris, at Alalak in Southern Turkey, in Katna in Syria, at Tel Kabri, famously excavated by Eric Klein and Asaf Yasser Landau, and even at Mari and Minoan or Cretans, we don't really know what they called themselves. Cretans are mentioned in the Mari archives 36 or 37 times. We do know what others called them. They're referred to as Keftiu in Egypt, Kaftor in the Bible, and Kaptaru in Akkadian texts. Um, now, at this time, again, with this uh, shrinking of maritime space, everything changes. Uh, monumental architecture um, appears um, not quite out of nowhere, but it becomes uh, much more expansive in the form of uh, several palaces uh, or buildings called palaces built around uh, various parts of Crete. Um, the first wheel-made pottery and um, an early form of writing that is um, undeciphered known as uh, Cretan hieroglyphic. And uh, we also don't know any of the other later Minoan writing systems either. But it's important to note that these things occur in Crete about a thousand years later than they occur again in Mesopotamia or in Egypt. So it's only at this time that Crete becomes um, fully a member of what I like to call Club East Med. And we don't have a good record of what the first palaces look like because they were rebuilt or remodeled. Um, but we do know that they all had public west courts with um, uh, causeways or walkways where people could walk in a procession. Uh, There's probably dancing going on. There were pits to um, plant sacred trees at um, Festos and at uh, Malia. I mean, at Festos and Knossos. And the ones at Malia here on the bottom uh, were actually above ground granaries. And so we know that there were uh, rituals connected with some sort of public facing ceremony and that you had this indented West facade, which continues on in the next era. Um, the indented facade would have given it a play of light and shade. And it's been suggested that this was influenced by Egyptian architecture, such as you see at Mastabaz or Sumerian um, architecture. And you have behind these indented facades, um, uh, combs of long, narrow storage magazines. And it's thought that there's some kind of redistribu redistributive economy going on. Now, the characteristics of the new palace period, uh, which it says 1750 here, might be closer to 1700. All of our dating is relative based on pottery style and stratigraphy. Um, the only hard date we have, which is still disputed, is the eruption of the island of Thera, which probably happened around 1614, depending on whose chronology you accept. Um, but in 1700, in the tradition transition from Middle Minoan III to Late Minoan 1A, you have, um, it seems that you had an earthquake on Crete and after this earthquake, there was a rebuilding and remodeling, plus um, additional monumental buildings were constructed, uh, some in the style of the palaces and many others in the style of palatial style villas, um, up to at least 29 of these. Um, you have new pottery styles occurring at this time. 
Uh, the linear A writing system also undeciphered occurs. Um, ceiling practices uh, expand, pictorial art spreads, and there's greater acquisition of prestige goods. And the pictorial art, which expands, you don't really have much, you have art, but you don't have much pictorial art in the first palace period. And it takes mainly the form of fresco paintings, such as this one you see from the island of Thera on the island of Akrotiri. Um, Crete heavily influenced the, the Cycladic islands around it, as well as the Greek mainland, and on seals and seal impressions, as you see here. And the new styles of decorated pottery include um, floral and marine motifs. And these characterize the period, known, the era known as late Minoan 1A to late Minoan 1B. Again, this is the high point of, my, of Minoan civilization. And the vast majority of this pottery um, was for drinking and pouring vessels. And this sort of decorated pottery pretty much only represents about 5% of the assemblage. And when you go to the museum, all you see are the decorated pots. But if you work at a site, you realize that this is only represents about 5%. And you have the linear A, greater use of the linear A record keeping system. Um, and it was used for what I like to call the ideology of the Minoan deep state. And that, by what I mean by that is the bureaucratic state. And Minoan linear A spread uh, um, overseas. It was borrowed by later by the Mycenaeans to write their own form of early Greek. And that script is referred to as linear B. So the script and the languages are different. Um, the Mycenaeans borrow the Minoan script, but they adapt it to their own language, which is an early form of Greek. Um, it's also borrowed by the Cypriots. Uh, and they write in a language called Cypra Minoan, which remains undeciphered. And the reason it remains undeciphered is because um, there isn't enough of it. Some of you may know my um, former student, Brent Davis. He's one of the world's authorities now on uh, Linear A. Now, Linear B was only used for record keeping, but Linear A was used for both record keeping and it was used um, for religious activity. And here you see a conical cup with an inscription in linear A on octopus ink written in it. Gary Rensberg has argued that these are possibly incantation bowls, comparing them to later Aramaic incantation bowls. Why not? And here you see a gold hairpin with um, a long, lengthy linear A inscription on it. You don't get these kinds of objects in linear B, you only get record keeping. So this is one main distinction in terms of the way the language was used. Now I mentioned remodeling, rebuilding, and um, proliferation of monumentality characterized the transition to the neo-palatial period. And I wanna talk, just mention quickly some of the main features of Minoan palaces. And you do get some variation and exceptions, but for the most part, they're organized around a central court oriented north-south, often on a sacred mountain. You have a hypostyle hall in the north. Um, you have a, west, a public west court, which begins in the earlier period and continues on. Um, and this court often had uh, a raised processional walkway. You have storage magazines for um, storing goods to be redistributed, indented west facades, a step three theatrical area to view um, uh, festivals and ceremonies and religious activities. You have small dark pillar rooms or crypts, which Evans likened to the sacred caves where Minoan worshiped in the landscape. There were two main sorts of, it's magic. Um, there are two main sorts of Minoan landscape um, ritual areas, sacred caves where they left offerings. These initially started out in the Neolithic as um, burial sites and later became maybe sites of ancestor worship and then developed into um, places of ritual activity. And then um, sacred mountaintops and these peak sanctuaries, um, the richer ones were the ones associated with palaces, but you have also more rural ones that attract a different um, character of finds. Um, also, you get a monumental stairway at Knossos. This was in the east wing where it goes down several stories. 
the grand staircase here in the West, there's no evidence for that. It's, um, I like to say the only concrete evidence for it is the concrete that Sir Arthur Evans used to pour it. Um, what you have actually underneath it is a slope of mud. And then you have elaborate meeting halls, sometimes on the West, sometimes on the North and small sunken rooms, which you'll see a picture of known as lustral basins. And Knossos had uh, three of these. Um, now I wanna move on to my talk. The aim of my talk today is to revisit the issue of kingship in Neopalatial Crete. The title refers to the Edgar Allan Poe story, The Purloined Letter, one of a trilogy of Poe's stories that inspired the modern detective novel. The letter in question contains an important, important information being used to blackmail a queen. It remains hidden, yet easily accessible to the blackmailer. The blackmailer based his concealment of the letter on his assessment of the intelligence of the police. The police act on the assumption that the blackmailer used an elaborate means to hide the letter. The assumption was guided by their perception filters and informed by their expectations of how the blackmailer might have behaved. However, as the main character Auguste Dupont demonstrates, the blackmailer has hidden the letter in a filigree card rack, in fact, hiding it in plain sight. Regarding kingship, we might assume a ruler or governing body of some kind for Minoan civilization as a highly complex society which required different levels of organization and decision-making to manage and oversee construction activities, craft specialization, trade, and bureaucratic activities that characterize early states. Yet previous research and analysis by Aegean archeologists have expressed wonderment, frustration, and confusion regarding the identification of temples deities, and rulers in Minoan culture. The many colleagues who have studied this problem are not lacking in intelligence or in a thorough knowledge of Minoan architecture and iconography. All are well-educated and expertly trained. Yet here I suggest that like the purloined letter, the ruler is not only hiding in plain sight, but that our inability to find him as a product of our perception filters that are informed by our disciplinary orientations and expectations regarding kingship. Many scholars of Aegean art come from backgrounds in classics and classical archeology span and are informed by analogies with the literature, history, rituals, and other social structures associated with later Greece and sometimes with Egyptian civilization. When they look to Egypt or elsewhere in the East for comparative evidence in the form of analogs, the conclusions arrived at are not always appropriate or deeply interrogated. Coming from a background in Mesopotamian history, languages, and archeology, span I bring a different perspective in terms of considering the ancient East. I argue here that certain structural features in the organization of the early state and in the depiction of kingship, religion, and administration provide a useful anthropological model for interpreting the emergence of kingship in Minoan Crete as something following an established model of emerging complexity. I will conclude with a brief discussion of how emergent kingship in Minoan civilization could have contributed to the social instability and the end of the neopalatial period. My presentation is based mainly on five categories of investigation. The concept of the Sumerian temple state in Mesopotamia as an interpretive model. What the Sumerian temple state tells us about Minoan monumental architecture. Minoan ruler portraiture read through the lens of Sumer and the Perline palace. Bureaucracy, the rise of authoritarianism, and the destruction of Minoan civilization. <clears throat> Why the Sumerian temple state? If we consider Minoan civilization as a holistic system, it is impossible to consider its socio-political structure without considering its urban fabric, 
institutions and infrastructure. As an example, I propose that the best anthropological model for understanding state formation in Crete is to be found in Sumer, the earliest civilization in ancient Mesopotamia. My proposal is based on common characteristics found in both civilizations. They are relatively pristine civilizations. And what I mean by this is that they're not in complete isolation, but they aren't influenced heavily in their development by other advanced cultures. So they developed within their own cultural and geographic milieu, although they were engaged with the outside world through an early period. Both are characterized by a redistributive staple wealth finance economy based on domesticated agro-pastoralism. Both independently develop a unique language and writing system. Despite lacking in exotic materials, they were master craftspeople possessing skill in turning metals and other exotic consumables such as ivory gemstones and other semi-precious stones into sought after prestige goods. Both possess bureaucratic administration, but initially without the institution of kingship. Complex, and they were complex enough to promote social distancing and social differentiation. The social organization, um, the, they also possess the social organization needed to undertake works of monumental, large monumental buildings. There are also significant environmental differences. One is the practice of irrigation agriculture in Sumer in contrast to rain-fed agriculture in Crete. The greater availab availability of stone and wood as building materials in Crete. And Sumer was a riverine culture while Crete was a maritime one. Monumental architecture and the Pearline Temple. We might begin by looking at the architecture. The early Sumerian state was a temple state characterized by monumental temples, combining storage and administrative activities. They might have multiple shrines as well as other temples within the same city state. However, the ideology of a tutelary deity in each city was dominant. They were administered by a bureaucratic class of scribes and priests with a priest, king, or a lord at the top of the hierarchy. This system is evident for approximately 400 years until around 2900 BCE, when we have evidence for palaces and kings. At this time, there was an expansion of features and institutions associated with complexity, more writing, royal inscriptions, an increase of standardized measures for rationing, and accounts of war with different rulers competing for dominance. Similarly, the first palace period in Crete is characterized by monumental buildings, combined storage and administrative activities, multiple shrine spaces, and public courts for social networking and the context of ceremonial activity, likely connected to various rites of transition. Furthermore, they were administered by a bureaucratic elite. Archaeologists studying the Minoans have noted an absence of built temples on Crete, but have felt comfortable identifying religious spaces situated in the landscape or in small rooms of larger buildings. They've also felt comfortable in identifying large buildings organized around courts as palaces or court complexes, while remarking with wonderment on the absence of kings and the absence of temples. In my 1998 PhD and in subsequent work, I argued that most of the Minoan palaces were in fact temples, each with a different ritual and economic focus, which I will summarize here. The ritual focus could be determined by distinctions in the distribution and spatial syntax of various architectural features. In brief, Catazacro was focused on a maritime or water deity, like Poseidon or Enki, based on its unique water features and siding on the east coast of Crete, which put it in close connection with the Near East. Festos symbolized a, a sacred journey in the landscape based on numerous lustral basins, particularly in the southwest wing, which composed of a series of corridors 
and ante rooms dedicated to accessing the basins. And really they had no other purpose. Cornea was linked to trade and rituals associated with the prominent Betel situated in the West Court. And there are also cupules in front of it for leaving offerings. Hanassos, I've argued, is linked to a weather deity based on the amount of bull imagery, which had a continuous association with weather deities in Mesopotamia and in later Greek, Greece, and its orientation on Mount Euctos, which maintained a close association with Zeus. And some have argued that the profile of Mount Euctos actually represents the face of Zeus. Malia was dedicated primarily to manufacture and redistribution based on the amount of space given over to these activities, but it is difficult to say more. However, it is possible to suggest factional competition with Knossos based on an argument by the Halligers that bull sacrifice represented an anti knossian ideology. The suggestion for different economic activity can be linked to different localized ritual activities um, that can be linked to different ritual, localized ritual activities rests on, but is not limited to three categories of evidence for trade and manufacture in different locations. While I regard these as sufficient to prove my point, I'm sure it is possible to argue for additional ones. These categories include the finds of ivory tusks and copper ingots at Catazacro, reinforcing the idea of trade and um, trade with the East. The debitage and unworked pieces of Yali obsidian found in Northern Crete, in contrast to finding the finished bowls in Southern Greece, Southern Crete rather, as discussed by Betancourt. And evidence by Peter Day, Peter Day's petrographic analysis of oval mouthed aphoras and other transport shapes such as pithoid and pithoid jars. If we can accept that the Minoan palaces were temples, then where were the palaces and the rulers? First, the rulers. It has been commented on that no reliable iconography exists for a Minoan ruler. In commenting on Near Eastern and Egyptian royal representations, Davis refers to the Egyptian king as a seated god, and while Near Eastern kings are depicted in association with gods, such representations account for just a few of the many types of royal representations from both regions. Some of the earliest depictions of kings in Sumer may or may not appear with deities, and if it were not for the accompanying inscriptions, their status as kings or as specific individuals is ambiguous and underdetermined. There is not enough detail in the representation of their physiognomy to indicate portraiture in the modern sense. This is well illustrated by this limestone plaque of Wernanche, king of Lagash, dated to around 2500 BCE, who is depicted as a builder and feasting with his sons whose hands are clasped, or nanche and all the little nanches. The expressionless face with cookie cutter ears, a semicircular brow, a slightly bulbous nose, a slightly protruding chin, and differently rendered rounded heads do not realistically indicate a particular personage. Although status is exhibited in the activities as well as the shape of the face and head, gesture of the left arm to the chest, and the Kanaki's an elite woolen garment. On the stone transaction stela of the priest Ushumgal and his daughter Shara Egizi Abzu, said to be from Uma dating to early dynastic one, um, depictions are again generic. Ushumgal is generically depicted with shoulder length hair, a beard, generic facial features, a skirt with fringe and a rope belt with hands clasped to chest, while Shara Egizi Abzu is depicted with what is interpreted as braided hair, a sack-like dress, generic facial features, and one hand extended and holding an implement. 
The famous Warka vase of alabaster, circa 3200 to 3100 BCE, depicts social organization in four registers. On the top, an elite or lord is facing the goddess Inanna, her temple represented by two reed bundles. His image was removed in antiquity, but is reconstructed from other similar images. The Lord's status is not indicated by the generic facial features that include shoulder length hair and a beard, but by his positioning on the register, rolled cap indicating piety, hands clasped to chest, and netted garment with sash held by an attendant. The person holding a stack of bowls behind Inanna is understood as representing the sign N, meaning Lord. Although much later, dating to the 20th century BCE, the copper foundation peg of King Ornamu of Ur is characterized by similarly generic features, although there was some attempt at modeling the cheeks. Some royal portraits in Mesopotamia stand out for certain individuating characteristics. One example is the famous pink limestone victory stela of Naram Sin, dated to 2254 BCE. Although the facial features are not well preserved, the musculature is carefully modeled and the horn crown identifies him as the first king to hubristically represent himself as a deity. We are only certain of his identity because of the inscription. Also notable and easily identifiable through inscriptions, their material of diorite and careful modeling of facial features are the numerous statues of Gudea, king of Lagash, in the late third millennium. Gudea was a great patron of the arts who represented himself as pious through the rolled skull cap of a priest and depictions of himself at prayer or as an architect. And on the right, he has an architect's plan on his um, lap just to reinforce this. Um, adopting the title NC or Lord rather than Lugal meaning great king suggests another example of his modesty although this could, again, confuse um, later viewers. The stocky, corpulent face and muscular body are individuating features, easily recognizable and regarded as unparalleled for their realism at the time. Yet the unibrow continues a schematized and unrealistic feature. Like Egyptian statues, Sumerian sculptures were ristic, ritualistically imbued with life and intended to perpetually transmit their messages which in Gudea's case included the inscription, it offers prayers. To summarize these early examples of Sumerian sculpture, um, illustrate individuating features that the modern eye might associate with a portrait are largely absent. And the position of the depicted person is most clearly identifiable through the presence of an inscription, although the individual may also be associated with conflated and multiple modalities such as king, priest, or priest-king, or deity. Despite these observations, some characteristics that inform us about royal and sometimes combined divine or priestly identities stand out. Hairstyle, unusual clothing, hierarchic scale, association with symbols of divinity, association with symbols of patronage and or power, unusual headgear, particular gestures, hints at individuating features, special materials, and archeological context. So where are the Minoan purloined kings? A male bronze figurine, which you see here on the left from Katosimi, holding its hands to the chest, stands out based on both gesture and modeling. The only other male bronze that makes this gesture wears a conical cap, and from on the right, and is from Katsabas. Conical caps are associated with deities and occasionally kings in the ancient Near East and are worn by females on one of the gold rings on the lower right from the tomb of the griffin warrior at Pylos. Another male bronze wears a flat round cap and comes from the region of Festos. The Simi figurine on the left is highly detailed, indicating a higher degree of workmanship and a greater attempt to identify specific individual, um, a specific individual than many of the other bronze figurines we have in our corpus. 
His eyes are rendered with incised pupils, while long snaky locks of hair and large eyes and overly large ears may have also constituted individuating features, perhaps a particular individual who was a political and or religious leader. And it came from a sacred enclosure at this mountaintop site. Bronze is a material favored for dedicatory figurines in the neopalatial period. The widespread distribution of bronze figurines in this period might be seen as one more indication of the increasing wealth of Minoan civilization as further indicated by the proliferation of palatial style villas at this time. Based on its gesture, special materials, and highly visible position, the famous Palais Castro Kouros in the center might also be categorized as royal and conflated with divine attributes. A similar proposal might be made for the famous seal from Hanya at the bottom center, one depicting a man standing atop horns of consecration and flanked by fantastic mythical animals, a winged goat and Minoan genius. As well as the famous master impression, depicting a male in hierarchic scale and holding a staff or scepter, the symbol of royalty as argued by Tom Palima. And on the top right is a scepter head, stone scepter head from Malia, uh, a linear B sign for scepter and throne, and in the middle, another person with conical cap uh, holding a scepter. So where was the purloined palace that can be associated with the Kato Simi figurine? I suggest it was the lavish palatial villa at the site of Pyrgos Myrtos, which occupies a strategic location. It sits on a hilltop um, at the end of the at the south end of the isthmus of Arapatra, overlooking a river valley, and would have been a strategic locale to spot um, raiders or pirates. It is lavishly appointed with um, gypsum benches and a purple limestone causeway and ashlar masonry, and contains a stairwell, a light well, and an elaborate drainage system. If the ruler was purloined and hiding in plain sight, then there were no palace, then where were the palaces? Oh, I already said this, sorry. Um, and I think they could be seen as represented in the many palatial villas we get in the second palace period. This categorization, however, should be regarded as fluid rather than rigid. And here is the, um, what I would, the Minoan villa at Tilosos, which I would also regard as a palace. It contains um, meeting halls, um, a lustral basin, storage areas, a pillar room, um, bronze, and it also had a little inscription. So as I said, the categorization, categorization rather could be regarded as fluid. And we can see this illustrated very well by the Sumerian house at Tel Asmar, I mean, which is a square house, house style temple rather, which contained this important deposit of buried alabaster figurines. But yet it still takes the form of a house. Um, you also see something similar on Crete with the villa at Nirukani, which had an exterior court for gathering and contained these colossal bronze double axes for carrying in procession. And if we compare both of these areas briefly to Hatchisos, um, the Hittite capital, we see that there was an enormous city with a large palatial temple, the temple of the weather god and goddess. And it was surrounded by another four smaller temples while the palace itself was um, uh, situated in uh, an elevated area with its separate um, with a separate wall. And so these observations have significance for trying to understand the destruction of Minoan civilization. To conclude, we see numerous significant changes in Crete in the second palace period to review. Um, and these took the form of a highly developed 
visual and written language, a proliferation of palatial or monumental style architecture accompanied by elite material culture. These things signify increased wealth, upward social mobility, social stratification, and surely affected institutional frameworks and their development and their manifestation. Minoan civilization is often celebrated as peaceful and prosperous, but there is a reluctance to thoroughly investigate the role of power underlying this beyond Yanis Hamalaki's work on factional competition and Ilsa Scoop's investigations of heterarchy, that is distributed authority. Power networks distributed throughout the island express themselves through competitive wastage and through feats of strength. And by competitive wastage, I mean, if you look at these, uh, there are about uh, 30 or so of these uh, Minoan stone bullheads, like this one in the center, come from Knossos. Uh, their breakage patterns were studied by Paul Rehack, who determined that all of them were smashed at the nose. And it's been suggested that they were ritually smashed in a ritual to uh, symbolically attain the power of the bull and that this could be some kind of investiture ceremony. And the fragments of these bullhead uh, ritons were often kept as tokens. And we know this, that they were kept as tokens and mementos that were handed down because we find some of them in later contexts in Mycenaean culture, and even a couple of fragments from the temple of the um, Ingot God at Enkemi. So the evidence for Destruction at the end of Neopalatial Crete is scant. Um, before I mention, say more about that, this is just an example of feats of strength. The famous Minoan bull leaping scenes, which you would be familiar with, that are often seen as somehow connected to stories of Theseus and the Minotaur. I would prefer the Mesopotamian bull man myself. The earliest bull leaping scenes actually come from 2200 BCE Syria, were studied by Dominique Cologne. And it might be from there that the idea was borrowed. And it's not always peaceful. And you can see just barely faintly on the so-called boxer riton, uh, the person jumping over the bull is actually being impaled on its horns. And then upper uh, register, you have another feat of strength in the form of boxing. And boxing is a frequently depicted um, trope in Minoan iconography. And I like these because they show the Minoans uh, being violent. And I, I had to label it feats of strength because in our house we study, we um, celebrate, uh, we celebrate, um, what is it? Uh, the one from Seinfeld. Uh, Festivus? Festivus, yeah. We celebrate Festivus. We have a Festivus poll. So we have our feats of strength. So <laughs> the evidence for destruction at the end of Minoan Crete is scant and not satisfying, but a few remarks and observations can be made. Archaeomagnetic sampling of burnt mud brick structures in LM1B Crete, this is at the end of Minoan civilization, um, indicate that destructions occurred across the island at different times, earlier in north central Crete and later in the east at Pele Castro and at Catazacro. These events might represent a protracted struggle which contributed to displacement, anxiety, and trauma occurring across the island as its ethnic character changed from Minoan to Greek, or as Metaxia Tsipopoulou says, Mycenaean. I'm aware of just one example of violence directed toward the Minoan population, and this takes the form of a disarticulated skull of a young woman bearing a hole suggesting death by a blow to the head with a sharp object that was found in building B1 at Moklos, a ceremonial building. And this building was first damaged by earthquake and then um, purposely desecrated by breaking the ashlar stone. And this happens at a few sites in Crete, this breakage of the stone rather. Jeff Souls presented several possible scenarios on the subsequent conquest of Crete by Mycenaeans, questioning whether the uh, Mycenaeans arrived in mass and just took over the island, um, occurred, took, or if it took place as small raiding parties, or possibly was it already present in the form of mercenaries and migrants at Knossos. 
Gerald Cadogan has suggested considering more numerous minor events, including a variety of natural catastrophes, other than earthquakes as comparable to those set out in the Old Testament, including social revolts, piracy, factional struggles, and even accidents. This is plausible, but difficult to document archeologically. The motivations for warfare can be seen as slippery, ranging, ranging, ranging and raging from competition for resources and a desire for self-aggrandizement through territorial expansion at terrible cost, as seen in many ancient Near Eastern wars and as recent as the ongoing conflict between Russia and Ukraine. I end with the following suggestion, that the proliferation of wealth and status obtained by factions led by political and religious elites in the Second Palace period resulted in hyper-competition for status and power among them, which escalated into civil war, and the destructions that made the Mycenaean dominance, domination of Crete inevitable. Thank you.